Hey friends, Dr. Randy Lane Bunch here, pastor of Connecting Point Church and the founder of Connecting Point Communications. We're delighted you've tuned into the broadcast today as we finish our two-part series on the subject of divine healing. Not only are we covering biblical truths about the subject, but talking a little bit about the call on our particular life, the way God spoke to us about the ministry of healing many years ago. We shared a little bit about it in part one when we talked about the fact that God said in the last days, the ministry of divine healing will come under tremendous attack and I've called you to stand in the defense of that ministry. As I said years later, I understood that the Greek word apologia, from which we get the word apologetics, uh, really means to make a defense. It means to make a defense like a lawyer makes a defense before a jury providing evidence and testimony. And I began to realize, even as a young man, before I understood all of that, that every time I teach on the subject of healing, I would be making a defense for the subject, for the truth of God's word on the subject of healing before whomever I was speaking. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the second supernatural encounter God gave me in regard to the ministry of divine healing. But before we get into that, don't forget, go to the website, randylanebunch.org, under the media link. You're going to find all of our resources, our magazine, blog, podcast, past editions of this television broadcast on our YouTube channel, which you'll find there as well. And please subscribe, like, and comment when you go there. That would be a great help to us. Don't forget also, we would love to hear from you, so email us at info at connectingpc.org. Well, you can see we're outdoors today, folks. We decided to take our uh, um, broadcast on the road, as we oftentimes do. This is a beautiful spot where we do some of our off-roading. If you haven't been to uh, offroadadventures.org, we encourage you to go there. We also have a YouTube channel. You'll find under the media link at that website as well. We believe it'll be a blessing to you. We have some scenic photography, as well as a number of devotionals that we think will be a blessing to your life as well. Well, as I said, I've had a couple of supernatural encounters where God spoke to me about the healing ministry. We talked about the first one where God told me to stand in the defense uh, of the healing ministry, really to be a, a healing apologist, uh, to teach on the doctrine of divine healing and present a rational biblical case for the truth of divine healing from the Word of God. And we've done that for many, many years. And of course, we've seen God uh, confirm His Word by healing many people as they've heard, responded in faith to the message of the gospel, particularly when it comes to broadcast like this, our Skype crusades in days gone by, but even as we traveled in the field and pastored, we've seen many people have a healing touch from heaven uh, as we've ministered. I, I think back now, you know, when I was a pastor in New England, but actually ministering at a friend's church in Connecticut, I pastored in Vermont, but I had a friend in Connecticut call me and say, Randy, the Lord spoke to me about having you come and preach at our church. And he said, I want you to do a week-long series of meetings. And I said, it sounds good to me. And so on the Sunday, as we began that week-long series of meetings, Sunday through Friday, I was ministering in the morning service, uh, just preaching the Word of God. And at the end, I invited people to respond and began laying hands on the sick. And I'll never forget, uh, there was a particular woman. I don't even remember laying hands on her. There were so many people up front. But as I laid hands on her, the power of God touched her. She fell under the power. And when she got up out of that prayer line and went back to her seat, her husband said, you're walking differently. You see, I didn't know it, but she had been diagnosed with lupus, which is an incurable condition, as you may well know. And her husband said, you're walking differently. And she said, I wasn't aware of any change at the moment, but she said, four days later, my pain was completely gone. And two weeks later, she went back to the doctor and the doctor certified her completely lupus free. God can touch the incurable, my friend. And so we've had the privilege of seeing many people have a healing touch from Jesus over the years as they've responded in faith to the message of the gospel or the message of divine healing and experience the power of God in their life unto salvation. Remember we said Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, friend, that word salvation doesn't just mean born again or spiritual salvation. The same Greek and Hebrew words that refer to spiritual salvation also imply the ideas of deliverance, healing, preservation, and soundness. And in fact, the Greek word sozo, which is translated saved oftentimes, such as in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised from the dead, you'll be saved, is also used again and again throughout the New Testament for the, for the subject of healing. Uh, we talked about the woman healed of the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5, how after she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she felt power go into her off of him. He felt the power go out of him and he said, who touched my clothes? And when finally it was discovered who had done what, who had done it, <laughs> Jesus Jesus turned to her and said, daughter, your faith has made you well. But that's the Greek word, sozo, your faith has saved you, but it was salvation in a physical sense. Likewise, in Acts chapter 14, we saw how Paul preached the gospel, and there was a man crippled from his mother's womb who had faith to be healed as he heard Paul speak. 
Paul saw that he had faith, encouraged him to act on his faith by saying, stand up straight on your feet. And the man leaped and walked and was healed. We say, isn't it wonderful how Paul healed that crippled man? But actually, Paul didn't heal anybody. He preached the gospel. The man heard, had faith to be healed, and he responded. And as we said, if the man had faith to be healed, hearing Paul, Paul had to be preaching a healing gospel. And that's what we're ministering to you today, the healing gospel. But today I want to talk to you kind of about part two of God's experience with me, his sharing with me about the subject of divine healing and the impact it would play in my life in ministry. And I think you're going to find it relevant to you as well. And this was really uh, out of, I'm going to start with 2 Timothy chapter 4 here, verse 5. And I, I want to read this verse to you because it's relevant to what we're going to be discussing. And Paul's giving Timothy his last charge as a minister, as his protege. And he says this, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now you may wonder why, but I'm going to tell you that verse haunted me for many years. And the reason why is because Timothy was not a prototypical evangelist. We can read about an evangelist by the name of Philip, uh, who had a great revival in the city of Samaria in Acts chapter 8. And, uh, you know, we know of evangelists in our day today, like the late, great Billy Graham, uh, James Robinson, Reinhard Bonnke, men of God who preach the gospel. People respond by the thousands and are born again. I have dear friends uh, that are crusade evangelists that see this kind of thing happen around the world. But by gifting, I've always been a pastor, teacher, more comfortable with sharing with the body of Christ, equipping saints uh, to mature and develop in their walk with God. I've never been been gifted in a as an evangelist, at least not clearly. That was not my particular calling. I was more of a teacher to the church. And so when I read this verse uh, about Timothy, who was likewise serving as a pastor of a local church, and Paul told him, Timothy, I want you to do the work of an evangelist, I realized I'm not off the hook either. If I'm pastoring a church, even though I'm not necessarily called to be, stand in the office of an evangelist, I still have to do the work of evangelizing. And that always made me nervous because I knew that wasn't where my primary gifting lay. And I remember when I was in field ministry many years ago now, it'd be well over 20 years ago now, I was preaching for a friend in North Sacramento, and I was getting ready to minister. I was actually in the back room, just spending some time in prayer and preparation to see what the Lord would have me share that night. Back then, we did a lot of extemporaneous preaching. God would just drop a message in our heart, and we'd go out and minister it under the power of the Holy Spirit and see God confirm His Word in wonderful ways. We still do. Uh, but back then, we did a lot of extemporaneous preaching. We didn't necessarily know what we were going to preach until we got in the pulpit, and the Spirit of God would spark a thought, an idea, a scripture, and there we would go. And as I'm waiting uh, in that back prayer room, just waiting on the Lord, seeing what he would have me share, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said this. He said, Randy, healing will be your back door to evangelism. Now, I knew that he was really answering a question of my heart because I'd always wanted to obey the scripture and do the work of an evangelist, just like Paul told Timothy to do. But I always felt a little bit inadequate because, as I said, I never recognized in myself the particular gifting of an evangelist. But I did know that God had called me to the healing ministry. So when he said to me, healing will be your back door to evangelism, I was all ears. And just like machine gun bullets, as fast as you could snap your fingers, one scripture after another began to come to my mind as God gave me four reasons why healing would be my back door to evangelism. Now, when he spoke that to me, I thought he was really laying out a method by which I would see souls saved. And he was to some degree. But I also realize now in many years hindsight, 20, 25 plus years hindsight, that that was really a prophetic word to my life. Because the primary way we've seen people come into the kingdom is as we preach the gospel, prayed for the sick, and then led people to Christ. And as the healing power of God touches the lives of people, they're all ears to hear the good news of salvation that's available to them through the Lord Jesus Christ. We've had many people get healed first and then come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so God spoke to me and said, gave me four reasons why healing would be our back door to evangelism. The first reason can be found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. I'm going to read the verse of scripture first, and then I'll share the first reason why healing would be our back door to evangelism and may well be yours as well. Here it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and he, they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted <clears throat> with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So Jesus is cutting a swath 
through Jerusalem and through the surrounding countryside. It says the Decapolis. That's the five small cities surrounding Jerusalem at that time. Jesus is ministering to the multitudes. But why did the multitudes follow him? Among other reasons, because he was healing their sick. Uh, Raymond T. Ritchie, uh, a great healing evangelist of the early 1900s and even latter 1800s said, healing is the dinner bell. Uh, whenever you preach on healing, folk will come running. And I found that to be true. See, Jesus is still a healer. Again, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he was ever a healer, he's still a healer. He's just continuing his work through the church as that same anointing of the Holy Spirit and power that equipped him to heal the sick is available to us today, as well as gifts of healings. And so as we preach the gospel and trust God, he'll confirm his word and heal the sick. And, and I have found that as we minister the subject on divine healing, it's also a great way of stirring people's interest in the message of the gospel. You know, there's not a single person listening to me right now that hasn't either been directly impacted or have had a loved one or friend impacted by sickness and disease. Because sin is universal, sickness and disease is universal. Um, Alexander, uh, John Alexander Dowie, the late great healing evangelist of the um, early part of the 20th century said, sickness is the foul offspring of its mother's sin and its father Satan. That's a way of saying that sickness and disease piggybacked into the human experience through sin. Not, we're not talking about the individual sin, we're talking about original sin. And because sickness and disease came into the human experience through sin, the answer is redemption. But because Jesus ministered to the sick, it got people's attention. And as he began to heal the sick, all of a sudden great crowds began to follow him. Over the years, we've seen so many people have an interest in the gospel and in our program, particularly, especially as we're talking about, you know, on the foreign field through our television broadcast, we've had so many people come to faith as they received a healing touch from heaven. So the first reason why healing would be our backdoor to evangelism is because it touches, it addresses a universal need. We see that in the ministry of Jesus. That's why the multitudes followed him. And I'm telling you, there's still that universal need in the hearts of people that are desirous to see a healing touch from heaven. And I can tell you testimony after testimony of people who've heard us preach the word of God, especially as we've shared on the subject of healing, and then not only responded and were healed, but also came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The second reason why God spoke to me and said healing would be our back door to evangelism is that healing is a demonstration of the Lord's compassion. In Matthew 14, 14, we read this. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Why did Jesus heal their sick? Because he was moved with compassion. Friend, it's hard to be around sick people and not be moved with compassion. Think about it. If you had a young child that was ill and needed medical attention or needed to be healed, wouldn't your heart be moved to see, uh, wouldn't you, in fact, wouldn't you move heaven and earth <laughs> to see to it that they were healed, that they got the best medical attention? Oh, well, certainly you would. And God is our Father. He is our Creator. And God wants people well. And so Jesus was moved with compassion. I love something that Howard Carter, he was a, a great teacher on the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the, uh, in the 20th century. And Howard Carter made an observation along this line. He said, in the Old Testament, we see more miracles than we do healings. He said, in the New Testament, that, that's reversed. We see more healing than we do miracles. He said, the reason why that is, is in the Old Testament, God's demonstrating his power, thus miracles. In the New Testament, God's demonstrating his compassion, thus healing. The Bible said the Lord was moved with compassion and healed their sick. Let me ask you this. Do you think God is still a God of compassion today? Is God still a God of love? Well, of course we know that he is. And if God was moved with compassion 2,000 years ago on the shores of Galilee, friend, he's moved with compassion today, and he's still healing the sick because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, this third reason why healing would be our back door to evangelism is a little bit more involved, so you're going to have to follow me on this one, but I'm going to read out of Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And here we read this. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Sons, your sins are forgiven you. <clears throat> and some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We, have, we never saw anything like this. Indeed, they had not. Now, here's the question. How did healing this man prove that Jesus had authority to forgive sin? See, the third point, the Lord said, healing will be your back door to evangelism because healing is an evidence of canceled sin. Now, now how do you get that out of this passage? Jesus said, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sin. He said to the sick of the palsy, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And he did in the presence of them all. So again, the question is, how do we know that Jesus had authority to forgive sin by healing the sick of the palsy? How did that prove that he had the authority to forgive? Well, you know, this is not unfamiliar idea to us here in the West, and probably wherever you're from, you probably have something like this that you've heard of or witnessed before. In, in America, sometimes you'll see a movie or read a book about somebody that's on death row, and maybe they've appealed to the governor to commute their sentence, uh, you know, to stop the execution from happening. And usually these things always seem to happen at midnight, and so they're waiting on that phone to see if it rings. Is the governor going to pardon us before the time of the execution? And either the governor calls or he doesn't. But the very fact that the governor has the authority to commute the sentence and stop the execution is evidence that he has authority to pardon the crime. In other words, he couldn't stop the sentence. He couldn't stop uh, the consequence of the crime unless he had the authority to pardon the crime that brought the sentence or the execution to begin with. And so we see the same thing in the Jewish mind. Sickness and disease was the result of sin. Indeed it is, original sin. But in the Jewish mind, oftentimes, sin was associated, or sickness was associated with the sin of the individual. You might even remember in John chapter 9, the disciples asked Jesus kind of a crazy question. They said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, how could this guy sin to be born blind, right? I guess they had a belief they could sin in the womb. But anyway, in the Jewish mind, sin and sickness was very much associated. Still is, and we see it associated in the scriptures. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody that's sick is sick because they themselves sinned. But as we said, sickness and disease came into the human experience because of original sin. But Jesus knows this connection in the mind of the Jews. And so, you know, he knows that if he can heal this man, it will be evidence of his authority to pardon the sin which they would see as being the cause of the sickness and disease. Again, a governor of a state in our country has the authority to commute the sentence because he has the authority to pardon the crime. Jesus proved he had authority to forgive by commuting the sentence of sickness and disease. So again... Um, healing is an evidence of canceled sin. You know, there have been people that did not know the Lord, as I said, and then as they watched our broadcast, um, they needed a touch from heaven. I'll never forget the very first testimony we had out of India, or at least one of the early testimonies we had out of India when we had a broadcast airing there many years ago was from a man named Panraj. Panraj was a Hindu. He was not a believer, uh, did not believe in Jesus. In fact, he said he had even laughed at people that claimed to be healed by Jesus. And so one night he's watching our broadcast. Uh, there was something wrong with his knees. He could not walk. So he's just kind of flipping through the channels on the television and he comes across our television broadcast. And of course, what are we preaching on? The subject of healing. And so Ponraj was gonna flip past the channel, but somehow his remote got stuck and he had to watch me for 30 minutes preach on the subject of healing. And evidently God got a hold of him because he said at the end of that broadcast, as I began to pray for the sake, he cried out. And he said, Jesus, heal me. And he said, I thought it was a dream. Uh, he didn't realize it was really happening, but he said, I saw a hand reach and take me out of my bed. He told me on the email, he said, I thought it was a dream, but four days later, I'm still walking. He had been unable to walk because of his knees, and now he's experienced a touch from heaven. Now, what do you think that does for a man who's not in relationship with God, maybe doesn't know whether God would receive him or not because he's not a Christian, he's mocked people that have believed in healing in Jesus and so forth, but now suddenly he sees a demonstration of the Lord's compassion. What does that say to him? Well, if God's willing to heal me, he must be willing to forgive me. I must be uh, acceptable to God if he's willing to demonstrate his compassion toward me 
me by healing my sickness. It must mean he's willing to pardon my sin. You know, James says something similar in James 5, 14 and 15. He said, is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And it doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, and if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Why? Because the same redemption provides both the forgiveness of sin as well as the healing of our bodies. As David said in Psalm 103.3, who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases. The same redemption provides both forgiveness of sin as well as the healing of our bodies. Jesus affirmed it in Mark chapter 2 when he said, your sins are forgiven you. And he proved that he had authority to forgive by commuting the sentence of sickness that the man was struck down with. And he was gloriously healed by the power of God. The fourth and final reason why the Lord said to me that healing would be your back door to evangelism is because healing is a confirmation of the gospel. I'm sure we're all familiar with Mark 16, but let me read it to you beginning with verse 15. It says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any, anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. One of the signs that accompanies gospel preaching believers, friends, is that we'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I remember this happening to us in a very unique way in a church uh, north of Sacramento. I was in Sacramento a lot. You might recognize that by my stories, but I used to live near there. And so we were preaching in Loomis, California, which is just north of Sacramento. And um, we had an interesting experience. We were in a, in a congregation that was kind of of a different denominational persuasion. And they kind of knew we were from a different company, you might say. And you could kind of feel that that first message that we preached there was really more of an audition than anything else. You, they weren't sure whether they were ready to receive us or not, because again, we were kind of a different ilk. We're from a different camp. They're, you can just kind of tell the jury's still out. Are they going to receive us? Are they going to receive from our ministry or not? As we came to the end of that time of ministry, preaching the word of God, suddenly the Lord gave me a word of knowledge. And I said, there's someone here that God wants to heal that has TMJ, tibular meningitis. And when I called that out, the whole congregation began to applaud. And I thought, why are they happy that someone has TMJ? <laughs> I didn't know it, but there was a woman in that congregation. In fact, earlier in the service, she had sung a beautiful spiritual song, anointed of the Holy Spirit. And she had tibular meningitis, and everybody in the church knew about it. And when I called that out, everybody knew it's her time. She's going to be healed. We brought her forward, laid hands on her, and you probably can guess the end of the story. She was totally healed. Everybody could see it. Her jaw had been out of alignment. Now it's back in alignment. The pain was gone. She was healed. She had had the condition, I believe, for 10 years and was instantly healed by the power of God. And it's always reminded me of this verse of Scripture um, here in verse 36 of John chapter 5. Let me read it to you. Jesus said, But I have greater witness than John's, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. You see, friend, John the Baptist had testified of Jesus and said, This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the people loved John, and so to some degree they would have listened to John and his commendation of Jesus. Uh, but Jesus said, I've got a greater testimony than that. The works that God has given me to do, these miracles, signs, and wonders that you've witnessed, they bear witness of me, and they're a greater testimony than that of John. It reminds me of that church. You know, the pastor had told the congregation about us, and I'm sure that that kind of opened the door a little bit, maybe just a crack in their hearts and minds to receive us, but only a little bit. You could still tell the jury was out. But friend, once that woman was healed and they saw the power of God in demonstration, we had one of the best meetings we'd ever had. Why? Because these works that we did, that, that we did by the power of the Holy Spirit, testify that God's hand was upon us and that he had indeed called us. And I found that the, the, the work of God, the supernatural power of God, not only confirms the message, but the messenger. You see, friends, to some degree, they've not only got to believe the message you preach, but they've got to believe that you're called and anointed of God. And when they begin to see that, when they see the hand of the Lord upon you, they'll begin to receive more readily from your ministry. So, friend, again, why is healing the back door to evangelism? Number one, because it addresses a universal need. Number two, it's a demonstration of the Lord's compassion. Number three, it's an evidence of canceled sin. And number four, it's a sign that confirms the message 
understood the gospel, demonstrates the reality of it, the credibility of it, that God is the author of it, and that he confirms his word with signs following. Friend, do you know Jesus? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? He'll be your Savior and your healer tonight if you'll receive of him. Why don't you just pray this simple prayer? If you've never called on the name of the Lord, just say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. But Jesus, you love me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I commit my heart to you. I put my faith in you, Jesus. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I'd love to hear from you. Would you email me at info at connectingpc.org? I'd love to share with you, you know, stand in faith with you. And don't forget, go to the website, randylanebunch.org. Under that media link, we have literally hundreds of hours of resources that will continue to speak to your life and build your faith in the things of God. But before we go today, as always, we want to pray for you and believe God for a healing touch from heaven for you to experience that right here and right now. Father, I pray for my friends watching this broadcast today. We thank you, Lord God, that you are indeed the God of heaven and earth. You created the sea, all that's in it. Father God, every living thing, the universe, the starry hosts. Father God, you created it all. You created us. You made us, Father. You know the blueprint. You're the manufacturer, and you can fix what's broken. We ask you, Father, to extend your healing hand to those watching the broadcast today that need a healing touch from heaven. Thank you, Father, for chronic conditions. Somebody, you've got like a scoliosis kind of thing in your back. Your back is being straightened right now. We thank you, Father God, for healing blind eyes and correcting vision. We thank you, Father, for opening the ears of the deaf. We thank you, Father, for demonstrating your power to those watching right now whose hearts are open to receive from heaven that healing touch. Extend your healing hand, we pray, in the name of your holy servant, Jesus, Father God. Confirm your word, we pray. We thank you for it, Father God. We believe you for doing it in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for pastors, Father God, who need to see a harvest of souls. We pray that, Father God, you would anoint them by your mighty Holy Spirit, that as they preach the word of God, they'd begin to experience the word, the word of God being confirmed by your healing miracles, Father God, following them as they preach the word of God everywhere they go. We pray, Father God, in nations like India and Pakistan, Father God, Iran, Iraq, in China. We pray, Father God, that miracles would be, would be done in these difficult places in the world where Christianity is suffering such persecution. In Afghanistan, we pray, Father God, Lord God, that you would continue to bring great revival, Father God, all over the world. We thank you, Lord God, for touching people as they listen to the broadcast now. We thank you, God, for ministering not only to their bodies, but their souls. We thank you for a spirit of encouragement and boldness to come upon them, Father God, that they would fulfill your will for their lives and complete what you've called them to do. We give you thanks and praise for it, Father God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, friends, you can see we're running out of light out here. And so we're going to conclude the broadcast. But don't forget, go to the website, randylanebunch.org. Again, under that media link, you're going to find a host of resources. You're going to find our magazine, our blog, our podcast, our YouTube channel. We have an audio healing school right there. Just so many resources, again, that you can just listen to, watch, or read hour after hour after hour. We also have a link there on apologetics. Lots of resources that you can go to um, that will direct you to books, videos, audios, so much right there on that website, randylanebunch.org. Well, friends, we love you. Thank you for tuning into the broadcast today, and we'll see you next time on Connecting Point. Mm -hmm.